Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father and Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. From Isaiah chapter 7, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. Now today we're talking about signs, and I've got the perfect sermon illustration for you to begin. Or at least I thought I had. But I couldn't find it. I remember a couple years ago, I had used this illustration here about a retail store and there was a sign there that if you couldn't find what you were looking for, you read the sign. It was a big old paragraph, and it started out something like, if you can't find what you're looking for, and by the time you get to the end of the paragraph, it says, hopefully an employee will have found you by now, and if not, please start reading this again. And I thought, oh, that'd be perfect. And so I searched and searched on my computer, and I couldn't find it. So then I had to come up with a new illustration to start the sermon, and I remember there was a, a commercial probably 15 or so years ago uh, of uh, an older gentleman, and he's standing in the aisle of the grocery store looking for, I think it was ketchup. I think he was looking for ketchup. And, and he's looking for a specific brand, and he can't find it, and he says to his wife, I can't find it, I can't find it, and she has to come over, and it's right under his nose. It's right in front of him, he can't see it. And so I searched online, on, I couldn't find that anywhere, and I asked Kathy about it, because if, if I don't know something, Kathy in the office, she knows everything, and so I go to her. And Kathy looked at me like I was crazy, because she couldn't remember any commercial like that. So, 0 for 2. In other words, I have no good intro for this morning's sermon. But sometimes that's life, isn't it? You're waiting for the perfect sign. You, you think you have the perfect sign, and that great sign goes missing, or you have nothing to show for it. Or maybe you're like me, or stereotypically like many guys, and what you're looking for is right in front of you. you can, the ketchup's right there in the fridge. You just can't find it, and often Sarah has to come and rescue me. What's there is completely out of sight, and what may be true of Many guys, and of almost all kids, as they can't find what you send them to look for, is definitely true in Isaiah chapter 7. Now, remember two weeks ago we talked a bit of the history of what was going on during this time frame. We're not going to go into as much detail, but just a refresher of some of the background here. At this time, Israel in the north and Syria had joined an alliance against the Assyrians, and they came to Judah in the south and said, join us in this alliance. Judah says, no thanks, I would rather join the Assyrians because they are the big military powerhouse, and they will be the ones that we want to align with. So the northern kingdom, Israel, and Syria are upset at Judah, and they are getting ready to come and attack Jerusalem. And that's where our story picks up, because King Ahaz realizes he's in trouble. You've got the northern kingdom in Syria to the north. You've got Assyria to the east. You have the Philistines to the west. Jerusalem and Judah is surrounded. And as the siege is about to come, you've got to remember a siege was a standard military tactic back then that resulted in severe and brutal starvation. It was not kind on the inhabitants of a city. And so Ahaz is preparing for the siege, and he's out inspecting the city walls and the waterways to make sure they can withstand a siege. And Isaiah comes. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 3, God gives Isaiah specific instructions on where to find King Ahaz. And as he goes and approaches Ahaz, he encourages Ahaz, have comfort. God is in control. And in fact, he concludes that section, the last half of verse 9, by saying, if you are not firm in your faith, you'll not be firm at all. And as we read that, that word you is not specifically about Ahaz. That's the Texan you. It's if y'all, all of Israel, or all of Judah, if y'all aren't firm in your faith, y'all won't stand. You won't be firm at all. And so with that, we then get to today's text. Immediately following that, we read, Ask, the, ask a sign of the Lord your God, let it be as deep as Sheol or high as heaven. Now we go from that corporate you, if Judah is not firm, then we move to the singular at this point. And all through today's text, we kind of go back and forth between the singular and the plural form of you. 
Isaiah approaches King Ahaz. Ask a sign of the Lord, your God. Reminding him of this relationship that he has with God. But as we see in our text, to summarize it quick, Ahaz refuses. He's too pious. He's too deep of faith. He's not going to put the Lord God to the test, but God delivers anyway. And really, that's the way God works, isn't it? That he always gives us what we don't realize that we need. Ahaz, he thinks that he has everything under control. He's inspecting his own fortifications and waterways. But God is coming to show him something greater. And to give him proof that God is the one in control. And God comes to us whether we realize it or we're ready for it or not. Whether you are fully prepared for Christmas or completely out of control still, God is still going to come to you and he's going to give you a sign. Because God always gives signs to his people to bring comfort to creation. So that word sign, we find it 79 times in the Old Testament. Now, 79 sounds like a lot, but as we start to look at the locations of those words, we see they're kind of clumped together in very important spots. So God gives signs to his people. First one, Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, fourth day of creation. God created signs in the heavens of the sun, the moon, and the stars, and these signs are to mark the seasons in order to bring order to all of creation. So God's signs bring order. And then we move to Genesis 4, when Cain killed Abel, and then Cain turned to God terrified somebody would seek revenge on him. And God put a mark, a sign, on Cain to protect him. So God gives signs to creation to give order, to give Give protection and then our third time we run across the word is in the story of Genesis chapter 9 Noah at the end of the flood you remember what God puts across the sky rainbow right and the rainbow is a sign it's described as a sign so if the signs give order protection now as the rainbow was declared was given was a sign of God's grace that he would not flood the earth like that again. And then the greatest of all signs in the Old Testament comes next. Moses and uh, the plagues in Egypt, the plagues are described as signs as they show power over the Egyptian gods and as they come to bring deliverance to God's people. On the sign of the Passover lamb where they put the blood on the door of the uh, of the uh, the door of the house, so that way as the uh, last plague, as the angel of death came, that it would pass over the Israelites. So these signs bring order, protection, grace, and deliverance. And now God comes to give signs once again. He shows he cares as he comes to Ahaz and says, ask the Lord your God for a sign as deep as Sheol, as high as the heavens, and he will prove the power that he has and the care that he gives. But we know the story. Ahaz says, no thanks. I'm good. I don't need something like that. And he says that because he's already in cahoots with the Assyrians. He doesn't need help from God because he's already placed his trust in the Assyrians themselves. That's why we get to verse 13 when we read Isaiah or Ahaz Isaiah saying to Ahaz, is it too little a thing that you weary men, that you weary my God also? And you catch the change in relationship? No longer is it ask the Lord your God, but you have already removed your faith from him. You have already broken trust in him, so now do you weary my God? The relationship's broken. And even when the relationship is broken, when sin has entered in, we still get to verse 14. The Lord will give to you a sign. Behold, the virgin will conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. And you know what Emmanuel means. Emmanuel means God with us. Yeah. Imagine Ahaz's response for a moment. We don't get in the story how he responds to this, but to Ahaz, this has to sound preposterous, right? I mean, it doesn't make sense to us either in our day and age. A virgin bearing a son? And while he may not have understood it, 
it would make sense he doesn't because he's focused on the siege. He's focused on what's right in front of him. And he's probably concerned about this crazy prophet that's showing up again that's trying to distract me from the work that needs done. But God gives us signs whether or not we understand. And even if we don't want it, God gives to us a sign. And even if we're too distracted, God gives to you a sign. And the sign comes like this. When the angels said to the shepherds, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that shall be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord, and this shall be the sign. Exactly. This will be the sign to you that you shall find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. The sign is the baby, and the baby is Jesus, and Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is the image of God revealed. That which only the angels could see is now on full display for all of creation as Jesus brings to us the presence of God. He is the sign of God, and the sign of God is found in humility as he humbled himself, taking on the form of a servant, even being born in human flesh. That sign is humility as that sign goes to the cross for us. And the birth of God, the birth of Jesus, reveals that God is reordering, that he is protecting, that he is providing grace and giving us deliverance. And then as we continue into the New Testament, we see how John describes all the miracles of Jesus as signs, as evidence that the kingdom of God is drawing near to us. And then the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew chapter 12, at one point they turn to Jesus and say, Teacher, show us a sign. And Jesus says, No sign will be shown to you except for the sign of Jonah which is that the Son of Man uh, will go into the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. And so Jesus shows the sign of God is not just the birth of God, but also that Jesus, that He, would go into the heart of the earth. And it happens by another sign, as Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And what's the sign that we find there from Judas? But He points to Jesus by giving Him a kiss so the soldiers know who to arrest. And it all goes to the cross, which is the ultimate sign of God, that through the cross, Jesus is reordering creation, giving us protection, providing us grace, and reaffirming the promise that in Jesus, everything comes together. In Jesus, we find our sign is revealed. In Jesus, we see evidence of God's grace. In Isaiah, he goes to King Ahaz, and he declares this sign has come. And the nations are raging and battles are abounding as Ahaz and Isaiah are interacting. And while the weaponry has changed over the time, and the names of the countries have probably changed and have changed as well, you know battles and wars still rage even today. And that's true internationally. Just this past week we saw that's true nationally. You'll see probably in the coming days that could even be true familially as families gather together and you are forced to confront maybe some past conflict. And it's definitely true within as wars rage inside of us. But God is sending a sign. And this sign is to all who are in conflict. And this sign says that it will last forever. Because Jesus was born during the reign of Caesar Augustus. And as you know, Caesar eventually died. But this sign, Jesus, still lives today. This sign isn't temporary. This sign is eternal. And he comes with humility to bring you peace. For he, this sign, is the hope of the nations. And is the place of refuge for the weak, the weary, and the exhausted. Now, the problem is we have signs everywhere already. In 1970, uh, the band, uh, the Five Man Electrical Band, released a song titled Signs. Uh, I did not know this song, uh, but Pastor Marsis revealed it to me, showed it to me this week. See, uh, he helps a lot. Uh, That's one thing I love about this relationship, this partnership, uh, is that Uh, We often find support in each other and helping each other as we're writing the sermon. So he points me to this song, uh, and I tell you, at 745, some people started singing it from the pews. Uh, So no pressure, but you're welcome to join in. Uh, This song talks about different signs through the verses. 
talks about like a no trespassing sign, a members only sign. A, a first verse was about a now hiring sign. The last verse is about a, a church sign that says it's welcome for all. But then the chorus comes in. Sign, sign, everywhere a sign. Blocking out the scenery, breaking my mind. Do this, don't do that. Can't you read the sign? Signs are everywhere. We know that. We see that. But today, today we hear about the greatest of sign. And this sign is very different than all the others. The others say, do this and don't do that. This sign says, God did this and he did this for you. Because this is the sign that was promised of old, revealed by the angels and now shown to us in Jesus himself. This sign shows the grace of God and the promise of his presence. And this sign is for all. Even if you can't find the sign you're looking for on your computer, the sign is for you. Even if you can't find the specific brand of ketchup or whatever is right before your nose because you're blind to it, the sign is for you. If there are wars raging around you, the sign is for you. If your life is perfect and easy and comfortable, well then here's your sign. God is at work and has allowed that to happen. Because Jesus has come, and he is the sign of the nations, the sign of the ages, and he is coming to you this Christmas. Amen. And now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds together with Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. At this time we gather our...